You, yo, whoa, there it is. Welcome to Shadev, everybody. Um, shout out to our sponsors who make that lovely food happen. Um, speaking of 2017, new year, newly looking for more sponsors. So uh, we're re-upping. If you think that your company would like to sponsor Chadev, we are a 501c3. Um, so that might sweeten the deal for you. Uh, hit me up. Let's see. We do have some quick announcements. Richard, you want to come up first? Brent, Brent let me uh, have a moment to pitch the uh, Cha DevOps meetup that we have each uh, third Tuesday of each month. So it's going to be next Tuesday night here. We'll be back in the big conference room. And Marguerite Bryan uh, is going to be reviewing, and we're going to do a book review and just general discussion of the Phoenix Project which if you haven't read it, it's an excellent read, especially around DevOps. And if you've ever worked in a large organization, you'll swear it's about your company. They just changed the names, you know, to protect the innocent. Uh, but it is a train wreck, and it talks about how, you know, DevOps can help with that train wreck. So that's what we're going to do. We'll have pizza and soft drinks. And 6 o'clock, um, we're on Meetup, so if you want to go and uh, sign up and RSVP, we'll know to get enough pizza for you. Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. Thank you. All right. Um... I believe we got what one more. Somebody else wants to make an announcement. Two other, two other people. Anna, you're up next. Hey everyone, my name is uh, James, and I am the co-organizer of a relatively new user group. It's called Gig City PowerShell. Uh, it's based purely on PowerShell, which goes right into the whole DevOps thing. Um, our next meeting is February seventh, and be right here on floor five. Um, we're on Meetup. Again, please RSVP if you like uh, pizza and soft drinks. And this month's uh, topic, we're actually being sponsored by Sapien Technologies. Uh, their technology evangelist is going to come in and do a two-hour hands-on lab with Pester testing. Uh, Pester is an automated testing of PowerShell scripts. Uh, so come on out. Hey, please RSVP so we can make sure we have enough food. Hey, Anna. Hey, I'm Anna Sherman, and I'm the organizer of CodeXX, and we're having an event tonight. Um, it's intro to the command line, so if anyone's interested in learning that, it is a CodeXX event, but it is open to anyone who wants to come and learn. Uh, and that's tonight, 6.30 in the large conference room on this floor. CodeXX is like it's a women's coding group, so, but uh, this event isn't just, it's not closed to if someone is wanting to come and learn, they're welcome to. Anything else for me? All right, so um, we got QP coming to speak with us today about um, an Erlang game server that he's working on. Um, so this is going to be pretty cool. Um, he's also uh, in a part of our a regular attendee of our um, Chattanooga Elixir meetup, um, which we'd love more, more people to come and join us. We're uh, reading through programming Elixir right now, um, and... Uh, the format of is uh, we do the chapter review, we do like a historical context, and then we have another person who builds um, a series of exercises to work through um, to apply what we've just learned about. So um, we're excited to hear about Erlang, and, uh, and QP is a independent consultant in that area. So everybody give it up for QP. Hello, hello, mic test. Okay, cool. So, hey everyone, QP, Quantum Potato. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm gonna be talking about some things I learned writing a game server in Erlang. Um, first, a little bit of background about me and about Erlang. Um, I've been writing software professionally for about eight and a half years now. Worked on all kinds of stuff from inventory management system, uh, music streaming app, um, integrating hardware, point of sale systems, uh, some stuff for the federal government, an SMS broadcast system, uh, all kinds of stuff. But I like to make games for fun. So, why Erlang? Um, well, a while back, some friends would tell me, hey, I think uh, this framework called Phoenix is, might replace uh, Ruby on Rails for me. I'm like, oh, that's kind of a big claim. Then more people started telling me that, and more people started telling me that. So I decided to check it out. So this framework, Phoenix, is built off of a language called Elixir which Brett just mentioned at our meetup. And Elixir is actually built off this language called Erlang. 
Um, Erlang is a little bit different, maybe from, at least from what I was used to. It's a functional language instead of object-oriented, uh, which means that you, you can't, uh, functions are first-class citizens, and when you assign a variable, you can't change it the next line, which sounds really weird. Um, but you get around that with some powerful language features and recursion. Um, so, of course, the first thing I did when I figured out Erlang was where I needed to go is uh, I said, well, I just want to validate, make sure this is really, really the right thing. So there's a couple successful projects that have been written in Erlang. You may have heard of the uh, Call of Duty game. Um, Tens of millions of players, their backend's written in Erlang. There's some great talks on YouTube as well about how they handle lag and scale and everything. Um, millions of people play that. Then you may have heard of uh, WhatsApp as well. They have one billion monthly active users, and their team is about 10 people. So, you know, half of that part of the room could build an app that scales up to a billion users every month. So, think about that for a second. Um, so, how did this happen? Erlang was built by um, uh, Sony Ericsson as a telecom platform, and it was meant to be a solution for handling lots of phone calls coming in, and some nice features like we want to be support millions of events happening, connections happening simultaneously, and we need to do hot code patching. So we make an update. We don't want to take down phone calls, you know, for say part of the world. We just want the next phone call to get the the new code. Uh, so yeah, the. Uh, First thing I did, next thing I did then was, okay, well, this is pretty cool. Um, I guess I'll go to learn you some erlang.com slash content. <laughs> it's a great tutorial. Um, and there's a whole bunch of really awesome in-depth stuff about learning, and they start you off from the very beginning. Highly recommend it. Uh, it's really good. Um, yeah, so just to show you uh, a little bit of, uh, oh yeah, so one more thing I just want to say about, um, well, let me back up a second. So, so, again, so I, I like to make games for fun. Uh, I prototyped a little board game with some friends, and they liked it a lot more than I expected, really. I was like, oh, well, maybe I should turn this to a computer game. People are telling me I should learn this new language. Maybe I can combine both. So let me check it out. So just to give you a really um, simple example of a really nice feature in Erlang called pattern matching. So maybe you've seen function overloading in other languages where you have like, the same function, but you have different definitions of it that take different parameters. And some languages let you have functions with different parameters, um, like a different quantity of parameters, and others let you match on the type of value that you're passing in as those parameters. Erlang actually lets you match on the value that's passed in, which is, lets you do stuff like this. So this is a factorial function, and this whole two lines here is the definition for that. Um, so you start off with your base case, and factorial of one, one, the factorial of n is gonna be n times the factorial of n minus one. So what happens when this runs is this function will be called, and if this value here, at the first parameter is one, one will get returned here. So what happens is you call fact you know, of six or something, and it'll say, okay, six times factorial of six minus one, which is five, recur five, four, three, two, one, et cetera. And just to demo that real quick, um, Is that okay on the screen? Okay, so I'm just gonna compile my talk here. I'm gonna say talk factorial one. So that's a module name, function name, parameters, and period is like a semicolon in a lot of other languages, like execute this, run this. Okay, factorial one, two, six, seven, twenty. Ten is like three, six, eight, so yeah. So uh, pretty cool. So this is a really simple example. Uh, I'll have a more complicated example of how this is useful later in the talk. Um, so the next thing I want to do is just show a quick demo uh, of the game, just kind of show you that this does work. Um, so the, the game is kind of silly. It's a little simple. It's, uh, you've got these ninjas. They're in a temple. They're fighting. Who knows why? Um, and the way we played uh, board games, we have these dice. And so I reveal one dice, and that says, like, who am I targeting? And the other dice uh, is what action I want to take against them. So if, uh, if someone tries to attack you, but you counter their attack, then you would kill them and you get a point. Uh, pretty simple, sort of like rock, paper, scissors with multiple people. So I'm going to go for a live demo here. Hopefully <laughs> everything works well. So um, 
Right now, I'm going to my local host. I'm going to join um, name equals A. And oh, no. Hang on. Cool, OK. Name equals B. I join as B. Um, I know this is not JSON. We'll get on that later. JSON is possible. <laughs> um, but my intention here was to learn Erlang, and I figured, hey, I can let the client side parse whatever. I'll get into that later. Um, but this is saying, OK, B join. They have zero points. And I just threw in some, your auth token is you know, off. Um, Say so A joins. Now I get the game state back. B's in there. A's in there. Your new auth token is this. Now I'm going to do an action. I'm going to say uh, uh, name equals, well, this is all my URL params. Sorry, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, name is A, action is kill, target equals B, and auth equals my auth, that token. And it record it. It gets, gives you back, here's the current game state. So the game actually runs on a timer. Every 10 seconds, it's going to update the game logic and give a new game state back. So now if I try to join with another, um, another player, say the name is C, B should be gone and A should have a point. And B's not there. C joined the fixture. A is there and has a point. So yeah, it works. Um, so what's happening under the hood? Um, so yeah, so I've, I've done game development for a while on the side. And typically, I do object-oriented um, JavaScript, Ruby, Objective-C. And um, I think it kind of sucks. And that's just my, my opinion on doing it for a while. Um, it's good. It works. but. The reason I say I don't like it is that I think object-oriented tends to incur, it can encourage some bad habits on like the tendency towards God objects. And I know there's a lot of techniques to mitigate that. So like you can do um, just like good object design, right? Um, if you have a, a hierarchy of that's just like growing of a big nested chain of objects, maybe you try composing your objects with you know, okay, I'm gonna compose this big object but from lots of little pieces. And I really like that, that works. Um, you can also do smart message passing, uh, pub sub designs where objects, instead of knowing explicitly who they're talking to, they just send out a message and say, hey, I want to, you know, here's a message I want to send out, and anyone who's listening is going to receive that. And that works. Um, but even then, I still found, find that a lot of times I sort of work and build code sort of from the, the outside in. Like I start off and say I'm doing a new web app for a client. Say, so, okay, well, I'm thinking about the model or the database scheme it is, then I'll maybe start filling out some boilerplate uh, of views and controller actions and stuff. It's like time and also a lot of mental energy of just like, what is the foundation to come in? Uh, for a game, I might do, like for this game, I might say, okay, well, I've got this some kind of arena, and maybe there's some players in the arena, and uh, maybe there's a queue. If you know, too many players try to join, they can put into a queue, and then the combat resolution would be, and scoring would be kind of just scattered around in this big game object or arena object or something. Um, so what I found was really cool about Erlang is that it lets you, it's all about data transformation. That's what functional programming is about. You have some data, you want to transform it. And Erlang syntax really helps you do that really well. So I started off at the, ba at the basis of the game. I said, what is this game about? It's not about, it's not about network connections. It's not about scoring points or anything. It's about resolving combat. So I made a module called Resolution. Its API is really simple. It exports one function called fight, where it's going to take in some ninjas fighting, and it's going to give you back the result. Um, and here's a little test I wrote. So it's a counter test. It's saying, OK, my counting ninjas. And this is a, a tuple in Erlang. So tuples are, are ordered, so the order matters, and you can put whatever you want in them. So in this case, I'm saying, well, if A is first, and they're countering, that's their action, and then B is their target. Um, and then the next one is B, and they're trying to kill A. And now I'm going to assert with this equal sign that the result of fight with the counter ninjas is that A is immune and B is dead, because A made a successful counter. And this works. So why does this work? So if I come down to my um, resolution, you, the way that pattern matching works, it lets you do stuff like this. So this line here, this first sign will say, um, a will get is unbound at the time when this is called. It doesn't equal anything. So a tuple's passed in. It checks the value A. And if that happens to match over here with this other A in the second part, this would be like someone targeting themselves. So I mark this task as unresolved. Nothing's going to happen. Semicolon there. Oops, marks the, uh, the next case here. So in this case, if ninja A 
is trying to counter B, and B here is trying to kill A, then A is immune. So in another language, this might look like, okay, if ninja.action equal equals you know, constant for counter, and or maybe a nested if statement, you say, well, then if uh, my uh, if ninja.action target equals B, and you know, another nested if statement, or maybe an and, if uh, ninja action for B dot action equals kill and ninja target ninja action target equals A, then this happens. So, like all this nested logic. I find it's really easy to make mistakes doing that, whereas, um, and this is just one line of saying what happens and saying the case that happens and the result. Uh, other things like matching on, you know, do guard checks in your functions like, hey, if this, uh, if this array is null, then return false. If this array contains a special item, then return to something else. And then now here's really the logic I wanna write. And what I find when I'm reading that code later is like, well, I've got this like first check and the second check, and I have to hold that in my mind while I'm thinking about the actual logic of my code. And so then a month later comes by, I come back and I'm like, oh man, how important are those first two checks? Was it really important? Can I maybe refactor those? I don't know, maybe. Um, Whereas Erling, I find that I can see this more modular, and I find it easier psychologically just to make change on things. So I can see very quickly what's happening. Um, so yeah, and there's I have all my cases here, right? If, uh, if I get to the point where um, this all happens, by the way, from top down. So this is effectively like an if-else statement, but I find it much easier to read. Um, yeah, so, what, so what's next step? So I've got this combat resolution. And also, again, I start at the bottom. There's no concept of points or anything. So what, what's the next step? So I think the next step is really um, this idea of an arena. So now I have another um, object, which is gonna, or I said object, <laughs> another module. And this arena is gonna be about people joining the arena as well as scoring points. So people join, and if they get, um, you know, like, like here I say, okay, well, if you're an existing combatant, um, uh, well, sorry, wrong thing. Um, let me check something real quick. Yep. Sorry, I, uh, I jumped up a little bit. Um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I have uh, ninjas joining this arena. I'm gonna make a, a queue. Uh, sorry, ninjas joining, and I'm gonna score points with them. So I can do that down here where and check out this index here, my points function. I know I'm skipping over a lot, this could all be online, I don't really have time to go into everything. Um, just hopefully show you, show you some ideas here. So check out the syntax, points, if they're a slayer, you know, they killed a rebel ninja, they get a point. Uh, otherwise, this underscore lets you match on, this is sort of like a universal else, you know, otherwise, zero points. So I call fight on the arena, and what's going on here is I'm, this is a recursive function where I'm gonna take in a ninja, action, their target, I don't care about the score right now. And then that right there, that's the saying, I'm this list, or it's kind of like an array, um, and that's the rest of them, rest of the ninjas to be done. So I want to recur and call fight again with the rest of the ninjas. I'm going to append to my converted list what, um, what the uh, ninja action target is. And once I've converted all these to the format I want, I can call resolution with those and call score on that. And so you'll see a lot of this syn syntax where you're sort of like iterating through a list, transforming data on it, so like you're popping off the head off one list and then appending to another list, that's your transform data. And then like here, this is pattern matching saying, okay, if my first list is empty and this is my resolve, my resolution, then just return that value. So I know this might look a little verbose and I, I kind of wasn't sure about it when I first saw it, but after working with it a bit, I found that it makes, it makes sense and it can work well. Um, so, start off at the resolution, this arena, and then this idea of the temple, which is gonna have an arena inside of it where the fighting happens, and that arena's got the combat resolution, but the temple is also gonna have a queue, and here when I call new in my arena, I get back, um, sorry, new in my temple, I'm gonna get back a new arena, and then an empty queue, which I made a comment because it's just, a, it's just an empty list. Um, so what I'm doing is here, I'm sort of like stacking up my modules on each other, which is an experiment for me. It's usually I would have had like a game object or you know one big arena object that handled everything. 
But what happened is all this code, like I didn't worry about scoring points until I got the combat resolution done. I didn't worry about queues, uh, people queuing up to fight until I got the scoring points work. And if I come from some, from a top-down perspective, I might have mixed this up. I might have thought, oh wait, I have to go get this feature and tried to plan ahead. And I'm sure you all know you try to plan ahead too much, then your code gets really bad. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so that's sort of the, the logic side of things. So now to um, talk about um, uh, Cowboy, which is a Erlang web server. So there's, you can look them up, uh, have a tutorial, and you, know, you make a directory, and then you want, they want you to get this file, uh, erlang.mk. I'm like, oh, what's that? Um, it is a huge file. <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny, and it's, uh, it's actually the package manager, which, I don't know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it looks a little silly, but it works. It's basically a listing of all the packages that are in the ecosystem. Um, so let's not worry about that right now. Um, but yeah, going down this tutorial, and they want you to bootstrap. Uh, now this is something I ran into. They tell you to use Make. Um, I spent a half an hour trying to get Make to work on my machine, and it didn't work. So I ended up switching to GMake or GNU Make, and when I did, it worked. Your mileage may vary, but just a heads up, if you try that, just know, replace make with gmake, and it worked fine for me. Um, so like make run, you do gmake run. Um, so once I got that working, I got a web server up and running. So what does that give you? So it gives, um, I have a module here, uh, and it prepended underscore app, so my Earl app app, and it's gonna exhibit the behavior of an application, which is sort of like an interface or a protocol in other languages saying, hey, I'm, I'm implementing this behavior. And so Cowboy is sort of like, sort of like Sinatra and Ruby or um, Express, if you use that, um, where you just kind of have some simple routing and it sends, gets code in from a request and then sends it off to your handler and that's kind of all it does. So uh, there are tools for doing things, you know, like tracking sessions better and cookies and, um, you know, authentication, databases, et cetera. Um, but I really wanted to just kind of dive in and see what I could get going from the ground up. I think it's the best way to learn things. So it starts off with a dispatch, um, and we're called Cowboy Router and Compile. And this is where you fill in uh, what your handlers are. So I've got a, an action, slash action is gonna take me to my action handler, that's the name of my module. Slash join is gonna take me to my hello handler. And yeah, so there's just name, names of your module, so you could fill this out, you could dynamically generate this from some other file, right? Um, and then down here, I'm gonna say, okay, Cowboy start. By the way, just quick, I want to say, say something quick. There's return values, so return values can be anything, but if they're tuples, usually the first value in Erlang is like an okay or error, and the second value is more information. In this case, we just are asserting that it's okay. Um, we don't care about that, so it's just an underscore. We're not gonna worry about it. Um, if this doesn't pattern match correctly, oops, if this ran and that wasn't okay, your program would stop and you get an error, and you know what was wrong. Uh, so I'm gonna call cowboy start clear, now this my HTTP listener, that's actually Cowboy's HTTP listener, that's not my module, that just comes in, in, the, in the program. So um, then you give it a, a port, I'm not sure what that 100 value is, um, but you give it a port, 8080, and an environment with a dispatch that we created up here. So that is pretty much the bare bones. These next two few lines I'll get into later if we have time, but um, that's my game logic stuff. But then at the very end we call the Earl app supervisor and tell it to start link. So this is telling the supervisor to monitor this process that we're running uh, of, this, of this web service. And if something goes wrong, you know, make a note of it, log the error out, uh, try to restart it if you can. Um, and all this stuff is very, the template's pretty good in the tutorial um, for this part of showing you what, what you need to do. Um, so let's go to the hello handler for the join. Now, I actually ran some trouble with this because the documentation online gives you the wrong format for the function, which sucks. But, you can run gmake uh, docs locally, or you can get help from people on Stack Overflow and figure out the right <laughs> uh, function uh, definition, or copy my code. Uh, so this is what it's supposed to look like. So it's module hello handler, exports one function called init, that slash two means init's gonna take two arguments. It's gonna take a request and some options. We're not, we don't use these options, but the Cowboy server needs it when we return it. Um, don't worry about line five for right now. Um, so now I'm going to get some parameters. So you saw earlier when I typed in the URL and I was just trying to do, hey, can I just do get, some get params? 
So you call cowboy request match QS, and then you pass in the name that you want, and I believe that is a default value. They default it to undefined. Um, and that's going to bind the name, whatever it passes as name, equals you know, A, B, or C, into this variable here. Um, this is the kind of thing I look at and think, wow, that is, um, oh, you have to pass in the request that you're binding matching against, or matching against too. This looks pretty robust. I think this would be a great thing for a helper method. Um, but again, just starting off fresh, you know, this is what you have to write. Um, so I get name, and then I try to, uh, I tell my, my gateway, which is guarding the temple, uh, I say, hey, gate, you know, I want to join. And now this is interesting, binary to list. So when you get a parameter uh, from Cowboy, it's actually, you might think it's a string, but it's actually the binary value of what was sent over the wire. Um, so you have to convert it to a list, which a list of binaries is a string. You know, binary characters, we call it a string. So this is because I like lurk, working in strings for the most part, so I, I convert it. But you could work in binary if you want, and there's a great binary module for transforming data and checking things in binary. Um, the tutorial recommends it, especially if you're working with stuff like audio and video, like reading color values for stuff. Um, so next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to just append uh, my authentication so that when I join the gate on the next line, it returned me the updated gateway that included the updated gate, including the new player joining and the value for auth. And now I'm gonna say, okay, I just wanna call list append on the join gate, I wanna append my auth, I'm gonna return that. This is something you do some more advanced JSON formatting for, but again, it's just quick and dirty. Uh, and next I make a response, so I call this uh, IOLib format, I wanna pass in a list wrapped around my uh, list that finds the game state, and that my response, and then, so this format, so it's called rec, zero when it comes in. Oftentimes you'll do like variable name one, two, three if you do need a couple references for something. Um, so there, there can, there's patterns called zero is the one that comes in and then request is the updated request or rec one. And I'm gonna say, okay, the new, you know, the updated one is, I'm gonna say, I wanna reply with a cowboy request reply, um, status code 200, and this is the binary string for saying content type text is plain. I did all this just so I could show it in my browser. Um, I don't have a front end API for this yet. And response and request. And then I return, hey, okay, everything works. Here's a new request, and there's the options that were passed in. So that's, that's how people join. So all, you know, all the stuff it's, that join is being triggered off, or sent off to the gate to join up and check for a queue, and are you already in the match, et cetera. So this is sort of like, sort of like a controller in, say, Rails or something, where you sort of get your request in and say, okay, send out the data and just return the response back here. Um, so now let's look at something a little more complicated. That's the action handler. A little more interesting, too, I think. So the action handler, this is where the, the core of the game is, and there's a lot of stuff going on here. So this time around, I'm gonna get some, some parameters again. Uh, name, action, target, and off. So I wanna validate that you know, the player is who they say they are. Uh, and that's all pretty much what we just did. I'm going to auth string, name string, an action atom. Okay, this is different. So an atom in Erlang is sort of like a symbol in Ruby. Um, and you can think of it as just a, a constant that's just equal to itself. It's sort of the platonic representation, like this is this thing. Um, and it's, it's, they're meant to be used when you have constants or like I know what this is doing. This is a very certain part of my business logic. I'm going to use an atom. And I love the syntax, the atom, is, it's just the letters for it. You don't have to do create atom from string or something, you just type it, and I really like that a lot. Um, so in this case, the main actions of the combat are kill and counter. So I'm going to convert the string they passed in for an action, try to convert that to an atom, so it's gonna be kill or counter. That way I can, else my code, match on, on an atom, which I think reads cleaner. Instead of doing like a string comparison, you know, is call string equals, does this string match? Um, and I get the target name. And again, binary to list, because I want to work with strings for those other parts. So then what I do is I call my function called valid. This is my validate request. And the first parameter I'm going to pass is start. And then I'm going to pass in the gate, the name, uh, the name string, the off string, the action atom, and the target name. And so we're going to go up and look at what happens there. So pattern matching starts from the top down. And it's called valid, and it says, okay, start. Again, it's an atom I, I chose. Like, this is a, 
really for convenience for me, um, for, for writing this code. Start, okay, matches that. And then these uppercase values are all variables. So because they're variables, we get a value passed in. Whatever is passed in will get bound to these variables inside of the scope here. Now I'm gonna call a case statement on, uh, I'm gonna send an action to the gate. I'm gonna say, hey gate, and this is where everything's happening. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass it, first the add a ninja fighting, which is me kind of querying and saying, is this ninja fighting? I'm gonna pass in the name. And if it's false, I'm gonna return back an error and say, error, player's not fighting. So if you try to send in, you know, hey, ninja XYZ, I'll say, hey, that guy's not part of the match. You know, you can't, you can't play right now. Uh, if it's true, I say, okay, I'm gonna go validate on my next step, which is auth. Now I'm gonna pass in again, gate, name, auth, action, and target. So the next step, so now this calls this function again, comes back from the top up here, that auth doesn't match start, so it goes to the next one. Hey, auth matches, and we combined all these variables. Cool. Okay, so now I'm gonna check on the gateway and say, hey, gate, try to validate the auth. That in turn will kick off a call to my guestbook module, um, but I only need to know that from the outside. I say, hey, the gate's sort of my gatekeeper to the whole uh, game. You know, what's going on? Validate the auth for this name and auth. And if it's false, it's gonna return, hey, there's an error, it's an invalid authorization token. Now if it's true, I'm gonna call valid again, this time with a shorter param list, because I know that the name's valid, I know that they've been authorized, so I'm just, I wanna validate their action next. I'll say action, gate again, and pass in the action and their target. So we recur, start from the top, that pattern doesn't match, that pattern doesn't match, action matches, gate, action, target. Okay, we combine all those variables. Now I'm gonna do another case statement, just kill uh, equal action, that is the equivalent sign in, in Erlang. Um, or does the counter equal action? Is it a kill or a counter? And if it's false, get back an error, unsupported action. If it's true, last step, validate uh, that the target is in that gate and, and fighting. So now, recurring again, coming from back top, doesn't match any of these, we match on target. And again, these are just atoms I chose for my convenience. I think it makes the code even easier. It's easier for me to, to work with. Um, and this is all the same valid function. So valid target, gate target, uh, check the gate, is ninja fighting target? If it's false, error, your target's not fighting. And if it's true, I say, hey, okay, and it's valid, everything's good. So, it's kind of a long function, but I broke it down, thanks to Erlang's pattern matching, step by step. I didn't have to do this, like, if this, and this, and this, and this. I said, hey, go here, go here, go here, go here. And I find that's really easy to, to read. Um, so now we come down here, and uh, first, I'll show you the error, because I think it's a little more interesting. So, this case is, is sort of like an, an if statement, where we're gonna get a response back, so it's case, call some function of, and if the result is error, comma error, so that's the atom error, because I either care about okay or error, and error again is a variable, we're gonna bind whatever value is passed in to error, I say, oh, no, I had an error. Well, I'm going to then generate a reply, and it's gonna equal, equal my error reply, pass in the error that was given in the request, so that can we, we can respond here to, we can respond this, uh, send this back out and show it up on, send it back to the client. So error reply is another function I wrote, and it matches, you know, player not fighting, and there's a string saying how into the arena, invalid authorization token, invalid action, your target has not entered the arena. Um, and this could be all kinds of, you know, you could see how this could extend to some other cases for your business logic. Um, now this is kind of interesting, so I'm actually, error reply is actually calling error reply again, but this time with a string and with the same request. So what happens is, like let's say it's an invalid authorization token. So, you know, the first line comes in, that pattern doesn't match, check this one. Okay, invalid authorization token, yep, that atom matches, and bind uh, the request. Now call error reply with the string and request. We start from the top again, that doesn't match, that doesn't match, that doesn't match, that doesn't match. We come here, we have a, a unbound variable, error text. Oh, I can bind it there. So now my string gets bound to that, uh, bound to that variable, error text, and requests finally is gonna get used. And then, okay. Um, and then I wanna make cowboy request reply, status code 200, this time I'm just gonna put the error text there. So that's gonna show back up in the browser and say, hey, invalid authorization token, invalid action, et cetera. So I really like how this works. You know, there's, I hope you can see how maybe you could write some helpers or something to make this more convenient or um, 
you know, use it across multiple projects. And I've heard that um, the Phoenix framework and Elixir, they're doing a lot of good stuff with that regard, too. Um, but again, you can see how you could do this on, on your own, right? Um, back to my talk. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the, the core of um, the core of what's going on. I, I won't dive too into all the all the code that's uh, running. Let's check uh, time here. Okay, cool. Um, so now I'll talk about something really interesting, and that is processes. So you might have heard me say Erlang's functional. You can't rebind variables. How do you track state? It's not a stateless language. And, and if someone says stateless, it's not true. You can track state, but you do it through recursion. So what that means, I'm going to actually switch. Um, I'm going to switch over to another project and show you how, kind of how that works. Um, so this uh, this is a, so a process is just a function, and it gets called. It does. It you can have it receive some messages and then call itself with a new state. So this is a, a little another another game I made, um, and I, it's one of my favorite games. Uh, but the developers didn't take care of it. Servers had some issues and it went down, so I'm recreating it, so I like it. It's about placing tiles on a board. This is the JavaScript front end um, I wrote uh, earlier. Um, so kind of move tiles around, just to show you a quick example. And then you can like slice their tiles and then take their uh, uh, last point and you win. Um, but what it is, I thought it was as a process. So um, game, the game function is going to take in the board. And the receive starts listening for a message coming in. And you can pattern match on that and say, OK, uh, first value is going to be from who's sending us a message. And next is going to be what we're matching on. So if you're trying to place a piece, we want to know the current player. And I have a tuple for grouping my, uh, grouping my logic. In the other game, I had a ninja action target. In this case, I care about what action are you taking, what, who's making this move, the player, and the position, which is also a tuple with x and y coordinates. Um, and again, I'm going to call you know valid input. I'm going to iterate. Um, now, what's because interesting is that um, iterate when it comes through, it gets updated board, and now it's going to reply to from that bang. The exclamation mark means send the message back to from self. That's the process of sending it, and then send it a status, the result board, and uh, how many tiles were sliced here. And then it's actually going to call recur on itself with game and call the resulting board. So now. The game function is called again with a new board that's been updated and it starts receiving or listening again. So just to demonstrate that, uh, I'm going to go tunnel and the board. Make sure my tests are good. Test pass, OK. Check my default board. Looks fine. OK. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say uh, process ID PID and I don't care about the board value it's going to return equals board. Uh, start, and that's going to give me back a, a PID, process ID. So this is now just running on my machine. Um, move this up, make sure everyone can see it. Um, so with this PID, I can actually send it a message with an exclamation mark. I'm going to send it, okay. First parameter is going to be self, which is actually my Erlang uh, REPL here. And next up, because I want to get a message back from it, I'm going to say, OK, I want to place. Uh, the current player right now, we're going to say they're X. I use X and O. And um, the action, they're going to try to take a tile. X is taking a tile. And I take it at, um, say, 1, 2. 1, 2, 3, 4. Did I do this right? Hold on one second. Action player. Oops, I think I might have. I have too many here. Let me just check something real quick. Oops, I messed up on that. Sorry, give me one second so I get this working. <laughs> um, uh, PID. Um, word. Start. Self. Here we go. Two. That's it. So now I'm sending a message to this process ID. It's from self. I'm placing, I'm telling X is the current player. And the action tuple is taking, X is taking at 1, 2. So I send the message. And that just tells me, hey, that's the process ID uh, self. And that was 
uh, what was sent. I'm gonna call flush, which is gonna receive, it's gonna print out any data I received back from that process. And it's gonna tell me, hey, shell got it's process ID, that's my, my process of the board that's running. And so it says, hey, okay, that was a fine move. And here's the new board. And so I passed in one, two, so this first list here is the, the files, or like the uh, columns coming down and then the rows are coming across, so one, two would be um, up here, one, uh, two down. So if I go one over, first one, two down, one, two, I see that X has taken that square. Um, so that works. So yeah, these processes are really lightweight, and you can have literally thousands and supposedly millions of these running simultaneously, which boggles my mind. Um, this all runs in the open telecom platform that Erlang runs on, which has just really lightweight, lightweight processes. Um, however, the behavior I just showed you that sort of like listen for a message, send a message back, um, you, do, you end up doing that kind of thing a lot. So what ends up happening is you probably just want to use this behavior called gen server. It's like general server. Or, um, and what it does is you can call um, send an action to a process ID like this, and then you implement this function called handle call. So if you remember earlier how we checked, is there a ninja fighting in this arena? Well, I implement handle call, and I'm gonna pattern match on ninja fighting name. I don't care about from, because it's a synchronous call, I'm just gonna reply by back. If it was asynchronous, I would wanna track this and maybe send it later. And this last item in the list of variables is your state. So I'm gonna re respond with reply, I'm gonna call the ninja fighting function temple, temple name, which is gonna be true or false. And then I'm also going to call, reply back to temple, and it's gonna be the new state that gets passed in. And in another case though, like when I'm taking an input, um, I'm actually gonna call input, get a new arena, a new queue, reply, uh, this is me filtering the data so the response doesn't show everything, like what moves other players are making. And then the state, instead of the original temple, it's now the second arena and the second queue, because we've, you know, we've changed, uh, changed that. So instead of having to do receive, do, and, and pattern match, and like check all that, you can just do handle call with, uh, with gen server. Um, so that works really well. So, yeah, um, that's pretty much it. I want to show you JSON, and I actually had an ex a working example, and I went back and um, I messed something up with my config. <laughs> it couldn't, wasn't compiling. So. Um, that's a little bit annoying. I know it's doable though. I know people do it. I'm probably going to read more about uh, how to build uh, with Erlang Make. Um, but there is this, uh, this library called Jiffy, which looks to be the way to go. And you, know, you can call encode on it and stuff. Um, so the only issue with this is that you're really going to have to do some manual conversions because things like tuples and atoms don't convert to JSON so easily. So for each of your structures, you're going to have to like, write a converter. I think there's probably something there where you could write a um, sort of universal JSON parser that would just take in stuff and you say, well, if it's an atom, I wanna say it just has a string constant or something um, and just sort of go down the list and, and make it there. Um, but it's doable, um, it's definitely possible. So yeah, that's, um, that's pretty much it. Um, I know it's kind of fast, had a lot to go over, a lot of new stuff. Um, all this code's gonna be on GitHub though, you can check it out, run it for yourself. Uh, check out the tutorial. Um, uh, but yeah, that's it. Um, any questions? Questions? I can bring the mic. Here. Yeah, I had like just one question. Yeah, please. Mainly. Just like, since it's procedural and everything, do you have to more or less uh, explic explicitly list all of your cases, or can you get anything like dynamic behavior out of it? Okay, so good question. So you, for the most part, you do have to list your, your cases. Um, you can use the underscore as a pattern match for saying, I don't care about this value, whatever it is. Um, so to kind of show you like in the resolution, like um, if I get, I get here, here, here. If I still have a pattern match, I don't care what this is, I'm gonna mark it unresolved. Now in that case, I'm, I'm actually matching on a, um, I'm saying I don't care about any of those values. So you can do that. Um, otherwise you do have to be 
explicit and say like, you know, this is what I'm doing. But um, you know, you can always call other functions to validate things if you need to. But yeah, you kind of got to spell it out. Yeah. Other questions, please. Developer experience stuff, things around like module management, bringing in third-party libraries. Yeah, so how those, how those build into a build process. And yeah, so I, I had some trouble getting Jiffy working, um, and I've had a like one wrong answer on Stack Overflow. <laughs> it's given to me so far, and I need to read into that more. Um, but I know people do it, and it's supposed to work well as far as bringing in libraries. Um, with Jiffy, was kind of interesting because usually you're um, all your source is just in this uh, source folder, um, but then you have a dependency folder that you can get dependencies in, like Jiffy, et cetera, and that'll go in there. Um, the way that Jiffy is compiled, you don't run it like a normal, um, like a regular Erlang file. It has this uh, app.app.source, which does, that's some sort of compile as an app behavior I don't fully understand. So it. it my understanding is that that's how you, projects get packaged up to be used as a package. It's all compiled. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm just, I've had some trouble integrating that with my project, um, but I know it's possible. So that part wasn't great. Um, I'd say as far as developer experience and just being able to start writing stuff and, and see it work um, was really nice. Uh, I spent a lot of time in my Erlang terminal just, um, trying stuff out, running tests, assigning values. Um, you know, I make a mistake, I, then I recompile my code live and just try it again. And that, that's been really nice. It's been, honestly, the best experience I've had programming ever. It's just, I feel like it's the most expressive language I've ever worked in as far as being able to articulate what it is I'm trying to express and then getting feedback right away. <laughs> you mentioned Elixir early on as yeah. being the language that got you interested in Erlang. Yes. Could you give like a quick comparison between sure. the languages and what factors would make you choose one over the other? Yeah. Um, so I think that Elixir is really popular now with a lot of people doing Ruby. So I think there's probably uh, a lot of um, maybe job opportunities there. Um, a lot of programmers that I used to work with are doing Elixir now. Um, oops. And uh, so that's cool. Um, I'm really interested in that, like expanding my horizons, what I can do, but I really wanted to understand Erlang first to really make sure I understood Elixir. As far as differences though, they're pretty close really. <laughs> they do, it's really more just like a different syntax. I actually prefer the Erlang syntax, uh, largely for um, that atoms are just the string, whereas in Elixir you have to do like a, a colon like that. I just, to me that's kind of, defeats the purpose of like having like, this is what it is. Um, and I actually like the uppercase variable names because it sort of sticks out to me, whereas when uh, in, Elix in Elixir you have a lot of lowercase stuff and it just makes it a little harder for me to read. But it's pretty much the same language and you can do the same kinds of things with it. Um, it was just written um, to be more friendly to, you know, like Rubyus and other people. Uh, but yeah, like I've, I've mostly worked on Erlang, I've written the Elixir book, when I look at Elixir code, I get it, it's the same. And the guy behind you had a question, yeah. Yeah, uh, you talked about the developer experience that you've had yeah. with Erlang. Uh, have you ever worked with Haskell at all? Because, I mean, <laughs> it, the, the type classes can introduce some really nice uh, stuff in the code, and yeah, stack um, is a nice Yeah, I, I had uh, one like half an hour Haskell lesson from a friend a while back, and it looked pretty cool. Um, yeah, Haskell's got a lot of uh, like good pattern matching on, on types of things and powerful t uh, types. There's actually, and I will make a note to put this on the repository with the links um, about um, thinking and types. There's this great talk I saw on YouTube, types as design tools, um, about how to use the types of your um, data as a, a design tool for thinking. Um, Erlang has something not the same as, as that, but Erlang does have uh, types, um, you sort of type uh, your data structures, like a type tuple, and it's called a record. Um, 
the syntax is okay. Elixir actually has a lot of nice improvements, which is which is a good thing about the language. Um, but in Erlang, you kind of got to know like the order of things coming in, which can be it, it can trip you up. It's minor, but it's it's there. Yeah. Time for one more question. If anybody okay. has one. No. Yeah. Uh, just an FYI, a new book has come out which I purchased called Erlang and Elixir for Imperative Programmers. Okay, cool. Um, I've read half a page of it, so I can't recommend it or not recommend it, but okay. it's out there. It's on A-Press, and cool. it might be of interest. All right, everybody give it up for QP. Cool. Thank you, thank you. Uh, join, us next, join us next week. We've got uh, Barry Coggins, who's right back here. Wave at us, Barry. Um, he's going to be uh, talking about using encryption during the development process. Um, so he's got a lot of experience in that area, and you'll get to hear more about that.